Hey everybody, how's it going? Seth Williams here from retipster.com and I've got the distinct privilege today to talk with MC Lauscher. MC, how's it going? Uh, good in yourself. Thank you so much for having me on, Seth. Absolutely. I did pronounce your last name correctly, right? You did, okay. yes. Awesome. Yes, good Sweet. job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So MC runs a podcast called Cashflow Ninja uh, where he, he interviews lots of, of big names in, in the industry and I was actually lucky enough to get on his podcast like a month or so ago. And at the time when we were talking, I didn't realize that he's actually an expert in something called the infinite banking concept. And infinite banking concept is something I just learned about about a month ago. And once I realized, hey, MC is an expert in this, uh, I figured I should have him on the show because there's a lot of things that I've been learning about it. And it's pretty fascinating. And I think there's... Uh, I don't know, as I have been trying to educate myself, um, I kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like there's definitely something here. Like it's a pretty, pretty brilliant concept and can be very powerful for certain people in certain situations. But everywhere I, I read about it, I, I can't help but feel like I'm not getting the whole story, like I'm missing something. So anyway, I just have, I have a huge list of questions here. I'm not sure if we'll get through all of them, but... I'm just going to grill MC and try to learn as much as I can for him about it. And if you guys are not familiar with the infinite banking concept, you know, maybe it's a good fit for you, maybe not. But in any event, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Um, so uh, MC, I guess if it's possible, I know there's a lot that goes into it, lots of little details. But just to give people like a high high level idea in like five minutes or less, what is the infinite banking concept? Yeah, and, and there's been a lot lot said about that. So basically what the what the infinite banking concept is, is it's people reclaiming the banking function in their own lives and they implement and execute the same by the same principles basically as what banks do. But they're keeping the bank banking at the you and the me level, right? Um, where it originated. It wasn't just at the banking level at big commercial banks. So if you look at the, the history of, of e economics and people and how we started to trade with each other, each other and barter and then found a better medium of exchange, which then, quote unquote, became the money, you know, salt, tally sticks, gold, silver coins, and then later deposited those into uh, a goldsmith or stored it somewhere and got certificates against it to a claim to something. You know, the banking function was always at the you and me level. So basically in five minutes, I would say that uh, how do you how do you achieve that? How do you implement and execute the same principles? Well, you utilize a vehicle, which is a dividend paying whole life insurance vehicle with a mutual insurance carrier. Um, and you use this to warehouse your savings. It's a savings vehicle. Life insurance is not an investment. So I think that's what a lot of people uh, kind of what throws them off. Um, so I want to be very, very clear that savings is to preserve and protect. I put a lot of emphasis on words because words are very powerful, controls the way that we think. And a lot of the words are just thrown around in this economy, like, for instance, saving in a qualified retirement plan. You're not saving, right? You're putting money at risk. To, to in the hopes of a game and you, you a gain rather and you're not you're not really even investing you might even be speculating so what the infinite banking concept is is to build up savings and warehouse savings in a dividend paying whole life insurance contract with a mutual insurance carrier uh, and that then can be collateralized right, right? Um, and you can access the money for whatever needs you have, whether it be investing in your business, whether it be investing in investments, whether for emergencies, whether for, um, yeah, whether for purchasing capital, major capital purchases, right? Down payment on a house, cars, uh, even, you know, even utilize it for vacations because you have full control over your money. You have access to the savings vehicle at all time. Um, and, um, yeah, you can, um, you can use it at any time, which which Im impacts the value of money. So instead of of, of uh, relinquishing all control, it allows you control. Now, um, I mentioned the four letter word out in the financial financial services space, life insurance. So I just want to also say that this is a very specific type of life insurance policy structured in a very specific way with a specific carrier and or company 
by a specific practitioner, and I call them practitioners because not all life insurance agents even know about this. They don't know how to structure it correctly, um, and uh, they don't know how to set it up. So, yeah, it, it's done very specifically to uh, achieve the outcomes that you're looking to achieve. I think um, that's just a, a big picture overview. I know you have a ton of questions that we're going to get yeah. into, so I'll let you fire into in, into those. Yeah, sure. So just to kind of summarize, I know like when I first heard about the infinite banking concept, the thing that kind of got me and, and the reason it made sense was because it's whenever you need to borrow money for anything in life, be it a house or a car or education, student loans, you name it. Um, I mean, one option is to go to a bank and to borrow that money and then pay it back with interest. And basically that's, that's how banks and lenders make tons of money is from interest. And with the infinite banking concept, you're basically taking a loan from yourself and you're paying yourself back and paying that interest back to yourself. And you're doing that into this whole life insurance policy. And I'm just curious. I know the first time I heard whole life insurance policy, I was like, oh, okay. So you're going to try to sell me whole life insurance. Like that's what this is all about. Like why does it have to be whole life insurance? Like why couldn't we just do this with a 401k or our own bank account or an IRA? Why couldn't, couldn't we borrow money that way and then pay it back to ourselves in that fashion, like why life insurance exactly? Yeah, you, you make, make a couple of really good points. And I think the first thing that, that people have to be cognizant about is the amount of interest that we pay to third parties such as banks and financial institutions. Now, you notice I didn't say the interest right, because in most cases, that's irrelevant. The bigger picture, the big 30,000 foot view is the amount over your lifetime, if you think about it. Just think about a mortgage, right? If you purchase a house, let's just say for $200,000, how much money in interest over the life of that loan is paid to financial institutions? So even if you lock it in at 4% or 5% and you're thinking that you're getting a very good interest rate, what's the amount of, of the total interest that's paid out? So I think that's a, that's a very big part of it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So from a from a big picture point of view now, why life insurance? Now, um, there, there, there's a couple of things. So I didn't come into this from the life insurance industry. I came into this as a real estate investor and I was looking to do things more efficiently. And as I was learning and I was being exposed to higher level level strategies, you know, I had a mentor that sort of had a similar to a family office set up where he had all advisors under one roof you know, working towards the family's goals. Um, it was a, a real estate investor that owned uh, thousands of units um, in multifamily, uh, the uh, old money uh, in the family. So that gave me a, a window to it. So when I researched this, and I recommend that all of the, the listeners and, and viewers should, I looked at a couple of things, right? And there were certain things that we were looking for um, that what, what what am I looking for uh, in a vehicle that I'm going to warehouse my savings? And why do people use life insurance? So tax deferred is a big one that people look for vehicles. Right now, a 401k is tax deferred and so forth. You do, it's something that 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 is tax favorable, but also tax free distribution, and that kind of cancels out a 401k because I like to control taxes. Uh, when I pay it, how much I pay it. You know, if, 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 if you're living in an environment where, where the country is $21 trillion in debt, there's unfunded liabilities of over, what is it now, close to $120 trillion, right? Social Security, Medicare, and so forth. You realize, and, and the other figures that are out there, by the way, is that 50% of the population, the top 50% of income income families, whether it's individuals or, or households, pay 90%. 97% of the taxes in the country, you know that there's a big, big ticking time bomb. So I like to defer my taxes, but I also uh, want tax-free distribution. So in essence, the vehicle provides tax-free growth over over the long term. I pay my taxes now. I don't pay my taxes th 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 30 to 40 years. Competitive returns is one too. So that kind of rules out CDs and, 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 and money markets accounts and so forth. Uh, contributions. How much money can I put into this vehicle? How much money can I take out of this vehicle? You know, if, if, you, if you're looking at IRAs, there's a, there's a limit you can put in. If you look at 401ks, there's a limit. I don't, I don't like to be told what to do. I don't know if it's the, <laughs> the, the, the pioneer bloodline that I'm in from South Africa, but I, I, that wasn't very attractive to me. Um, then also the opportunities to collateralize it. Now, 
Um, that's also a big thing. Safe harbor. I want to protect my money because that's a, that's what I've learned from studying the wealthiest people. You know, people talk at a cocktail party about Warren Buffett talks about, you know, rule number one of investing is don't lose any money. Rule number two, follow rule number one. But they put their money at risk anytime. So I want to put my money in a vehicle that I know I can warehouse my savings in and by preserving and protecting it. The other thing, too, is full control over it, access it at any time, how I want it, when I want it, for what I want. I want to be able to uh, collateralize it, right? Um, meaning using an asset and the ability to borrow against it or leverage an asset. And then also one of the one of the big things and the and, and the big picture over over what I was looking at is just how can I integrate it? Does it integrate easily with other investments? Because I was an investor, right? So the stuff that I look at and the vehicles was first uh, permanent life insurance and a whole life insurance policy. I looked at a HELOC strategy, right? Home equity line of credit. I looked at a stock account. Most of your listeners might be familiar with asset-based lending, where you can uh, collateralize your stock account to borrow against, to invest in real estate. There were CDs that I looked at. I looked at money market savings and then 401ks and IRAs. And when I looked, I, I, I researched all of this, the whole life insurance policy checked the box of tax-free growth, right? Tax-free deferred, uh, deferred taxes and also tax-free access, uh, competitive returns, I can contribute how much I want. I can take out how much I want for when I want. There's additional benefits like life insurance component to it as well, right, which helps with uh, protecting my insurability and my human life value to my family. There's collateralized opportunities. You can build up cash value in a life insurance vehicle and then using that, the money that you've built up as collateral for a policy loan from the insurance company, not from your own policy. So I know that that, that might be so, uh, an area that there's a lot of confusion about. When you access your money, you don't access it from your own policy. It's through a policy loan from the insurance company that comes from a separate account, usually their general account. Um, and then also the principles guaranteed. There's, there's, there's also a guaranteed growth. You can access dividends as a shareholder of a mutual insurance company and you're a shareholder by having this this um, this whole life uh, contract with them. Um, I can access my money at any time, you know, try to do that with a 401k. There's only a certain amount you can access. You have to explain why you have to access, you know, what you're using it for with uh, with uh, with a whole life insurance contract. That, there's no questions. It's this. This is the amount I want. And We'll send you a check or we'll wire it, right? You have to have enough uh, cash value in there, of course. So um, that, those are some of the big things. It just allows more control. And that ties into the concept of reclaiming the banking function, too, with infinite banking and IBC, because it's all about having control, having control over your money, you know, uh, how you use it, when you use it, what you use it for, and setting up cash flow uh, from there. So yeah, I think that ruled out all of the other ones for me. You know, if you if you run run it through that checklist, uh, it truly stands out if you compare it to a 401k, IRA, you know, money market and CDs, uh, HELOC strategy, um, and uh, uh, the whole life. You know, the competitive return part of it as well, I, I might not have touched on that as well. Just think about what you get in a CD, <laughs> CDs and savings these days, mm -hmm. uh, your 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 home equity certainly doesn't pay you anything. And then also uh, the 401k, I really wouldn't even consider it a savings vehicle because it's it's a it's a investment vehicle at best. And I'm being very generous here. Um, and it's not a place to to warehouse a savings, which savings is to protect and preserve. When I save an apple, I don't put the apple at risk. I protect that apple and I preserve it. Yeah. Yeah. And I know. Um as I was reading, uh, and by the way, there's there's a book out there called uh, "Becoming Your Own Banker" by Nelson Nash. That's what it's called, right? And that's yes. that's kind of like from everywhere I've read this sort of like I don't know if he like invented the infinite banking concept or, or not, but he's kind of like the one that everybody references in terms of like the Bible of of this whole thing. And one of the things he talked about in that book was most people when they get their paycheck, it's direct deposited into their checking account at the bank. Yep. Um, so if you're doing the infinite banking concept, instead of depositing it into the bank, you deposit it into a whole life insurance policy. And then at any point you can borrow money from that. So it's kind of just like saying, okay, instead of putting it here, I'm going to put it there where I can access it and where there's a guaranteed return. And is that, is that accurate? Like, am I understanding that correctly, MC? 
Yeah, so there's different ways, uh, different ways of doing it, but essentially you're replacing where you warehouse your savings, right? So mm. if most of us, and this is a paradigm shift, and this is through generations, right, that you warehouse your money in the bank. You go to the bank, folks open up a checking account or a savings account for their children right away. So through the generations, you just see you put your savings in the bank. Well, what you're essentially doing here is the money flows into your personal economy from your from your employment, from your business, from your real estate investments, and then it's directed instead of just the bank, it's directed into an insurance policy. I also want to say this too, because I think people think in extreme terms usually that money still comes into a checking account. You're not eliminating banks completely, mm -hmm. right? Money still comes into your checking account. There's a portion of the money that comes in that is then um, sent to the insurance company. So, you know, we try for our clients to, to the, the goal is to save 40 to 50% of your money. And a portion of that savings, we warehouse our savings in uh, these these contracts just mm -hmm. for everything that I just uh, everything that I just mentioned. And I have to say, too, when you look at uh, warehousing it in a bank versus a mutual insurance carrier, too, and a, a company and especially the ones that that we utilize, because, again, not all mutual insurance companies are equal. Not all banks, def most definitely are not equal. If you look at the, the biggest risk today, Seth, is political risk, economic risk, market risk, but institutional risk. I think a lot of people miss that one, you know. So it's very important not just what your money is in, but who it's with and where it's, where it's held. And these companies have been around, you know, over 100 years, some of them close to 150, 150 years They've seen uh, depressions, recessions, market crashes, and so forth, and they've survived all of it. They have billions of dollars of excess cash reserves. They have a different mindset than, for instance, a stock insurance company, because I know there's some listeners listening to me and saying, MC, but what about AIG, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? AIG is an insurance company. Well, they're a stock insurance company. They're listed on the stock exchanges. They're managed for their shareholders, which is their stockholders, mm -hmm. So, and they, they have to announce annually – uh, you know, annually and quarterly earnings and all that stuff where a mutual insurance carrier manages on, it, it, the company on behalf of its shareholders, which is its, its policyholders. Mm -hmm. So they have a much more longer range uh, kind of uh, uh, thinking uh, and vision um, and can manage their, their, their company a little bit more conservatively. They don't have to uh, chase uh, a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of profits like a lot of companies do in the Wall Street casino. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, Skipping ahead here to just one of the technical questions. I know you mentioned earlier something about how you can like, you know, if you have X number of dollars in your policy, you can take that money out as a loan and use it for anything and nobody's going to like approve you or anything. And I'm just curious, you know, let's say I open up a policy tomorrow and I immediately inject $100,000 into it. Okay. The next day, can I take $100,000 out as a loan or is it like... Can I take 60000 out? Like, what is the maximum I'm allowed to take out? Well, there's obviously a, a little bit of a, um, uh, a phase where it just, you know, you deposit money into a bank account, $100,000 in a bank account. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to access uh, $100,000 the next day, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a time delay with financial services. I mean, there's checks that need to that needs needs to be deposited and there's a whole process not to get into that weed so I, it's not going to be available the next day mm -hmm. it's going to be available in a t in a timely manner and that's all relative mm -hmm. uh, but i think the bigger picture here is you know how much of that money would i be able to access well there's uh, this is a life insurance policy so there's a component that will be insurance costs, the way that this policy is structured. And then some of it will go towards cash value. And usually of that cash value that's available, you'll be able to access 90%, up to about 90%, roughly, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's available in cash value. And that's mm -hmm. what you that's the collateralized opportunities. So let's just say not that you de not that you deposited a hundred thousand dollars, but let's just say hypothetically, there's a hundred thousand dollars of cash value from deposits that you've made into the policy. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to access close to ninety thousand of that, collateralizing it. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is the insurance company has that hundred thousand dollars, your account, and the death benefit is collateral for you, the borrower for that loan. 
um, uh, that, that, that you're getting from the, from the insurance company, not from your policy. So from a banking standpoint, you have two sides, just like a bank where there's a deposit side. You make deposits, they grow. The principal is guaranteed. You get a competitive guaranteed growth on it and then also access dividends. They're not guaranteed, but they've been paid out by most of these institutions for 100 years consecutively. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, you get to collateralize that account by getting a policy loan, access it on your terms, uh, what you need it for, and, and then you can basically use that for, as I mentioned, within your own business, you know, financing cap big, large capital pur purchases, emergencies, financing investments, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So somebody like myself, I have always sort of followed the whole Dave Ramsey concept of paying cash for everything if and whenever possible, like just don't do loans at all costs. Right. So this kind of flies in the face of that, sort of, because the idea here is to borrow from your policy for as much as possible, because the more, more you borrow and the more interest you pay back to your policy, the more your policy is going to grow. So it, it's kind of like ultimately a net positive if you're borrowing it from yourself versus a bank. And, you know, I, I guess I'm curious, like what types of things make sense to borrow money for like are we talking houses cars and college or like are we talking like groceries like little like everything or like just help me understand like where does it make sense where does it not make sense or is that just a personal question no that's a great question and by the way you mentioned dave ramsey and and Susie Orman and, and so forth and you know they put out a lot of good information for people that their financial house is in complete disarray. Mm -hmm. And here's the first thing that I would say for who is this for? If you don't have a structured, uh, I would say if you don't have your house in order financially, there's no magic bullet, right? Mm -hmm. There's no magic vehicle that's all of a sudden going to make your situation rosy. So if there's a lot of disarray, you don't have a structured spending plan. We prefer that, that word over a budget, which is a little bit more restrictive, you know, from the worldview of a it's a spending plan, how much coming in, how much money is going out, then this you should start with Dave stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the other side of it, there's you, you mentioned a couple of things, and the one word came, came to my mind. It's efficiency. Because what, what we look at is it's just a way of doing things more efficiently. So if you, if you have your house in order um, and you're looking for a financial strategy, how can you do things more efficiently from uh, – a savings perspective from saving for higher education for your children, from investing, uh, from b uh, basically financing capital, large capital purchases, right? Like cars and down payments on homes and so forth. And, and even in some of the home financing, because those are all comp very large wealth transfers. If you think about who, who benefits from all of that, it's banking and financial institutions. So there's a lot of inefficiencies that people have over there. So uh, to answer your question, you start with, you mentioned, should I just pay cash for it? Should I pay, you know, how should I finance it? So there's three ways that you can actually buy something. The first one is cash. Now you've bought something and uh, you have the thing, let's just say it's a car, right? You have the car, but the money is gone. Now, the one thing about efficiency is there's an enormous opportunity cost. And this is, I think, what the wealthiest families are cognizant about, what the middle class and the poor are not cognizant about is there, there's an inefficiency there because now the money is completely gone. You've lost the ability from that savings to earn a predictable return over time because essentially now you have zero savings. Now you start again, mm -hmm. right? And you build it up again. The second way is to is to purchase things if you don't have any savings and unfortunately this is the majority where folks are you have to finance it using that same example now you have to finance the car so you have to borrow most people get borrow 100 percent they pay it back now you've paid the loan off you still have zero savings and you have the vehicle and then there's a third way of uh of, of utilizing a an asset a vehicle uh building up savings in that collateralizing that asset to acquire another another asset, or in this case, you know, this is not even an asset, it's just a consumer good, a car, for instance. But let's just say, you, using that example, you build up the savings in this policy, then the money that you have in there can be, in cash value, can be collateralized, you can access it, 
purchased the car. Now you have the car. You still have the savings, right? That still is earning interest. It's protected. And now you're paying the interest back to the insurance company in your policy. But you haven't lost the opportunity cost of that money that keeps on keeps on growing for you. And if you run the numbers, because I think, you know, the truth about money is is scary. But if you really run the numbers, when you pay, pay it down, there's, of course, interest that's earned on a, a decreasing amount and interest that's earned on an appreciating amount. So you're going to end up, you know, not to get it to completely in the weeds, but you're going to end up ahead by, by, by doing that. Now, the real power, the real power, and you, the, the, I think it was the, the, the third part of your question is, what should we use this for? Now, um, you know, I wouldn't go as far as doing groceries. That's a, that's a little <laughs> extreme. So how we use it and how our clients use it is they use it for their business, you know, a cash flow management system for their business. Business cycles go up and down. There's many moving parts in a business. This is a foundational resource for them to sell finance things, to access, you know, things for payroll on a down month because there's a business cycle, right? Every single month, every single business has that. It's seasonal. Um, people within their own personal economy as you have used it to major finance major capital purchases, such as cars. Uh, they've used it, uh, for instance, to maybe go on vacation. And just a disclaimer, you're not going to get rich while buying cars through this. You know, that's, that, that's just a little bit sleazy marketing out there. It's just a way of doing it more efficiently. So you can finance those goods through it. And then, then of course, savings for college, and that would be a a podcast episode in and of itself, because this is a this is a financially invisible vehicle. It's private. It's a contract between you and the insurance company. It's not on your credit report. People don't really know that 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 people have this. So when you're running into like you know FAFSA uh, assets such as the 529 Coverdell, that actually in in, a, in essence penalizes. Your uh, your savings of your family, you know, and of course it's in the stock market. You know, you can only access it for education and so forth. So it's a very efficient vehicle to save for uh, for higher education as well. What makes it really powerful, Seth, and this is how I came into this, is by acquiring investments and in, for for instance real estate. So if you save money in this policy, you warehouse your wealth in this, your savings in this policy. You leverage your savings to acquire something and invest in other assets. And then redirect the savings, the cash flow from those investments where you would previously just redirect it back to a bank. Now you redirect it back into your policy. That's what was really powerful for yeah. me. Again, I didn't come up with this. I copied and pasted what successful people do. That's been kind of the thing that I've been doing in my life, just finding people that are successful, that's already achieving what I'm doing. And this is what a, a lot of families are doing in family offices, a lot of very, very successful investors. And I just basically followed their step. But I think that those are kind of the things that you should you should utilize it for. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, was there another part of that question? No, I, I think uh, that kind of, I kind of answered my question just in terms of because I think the thing that I struggle with is like take the scenario of like actually my wife and I are probably going to buy a car like tomorrow. Um, and we've actually been looking at this because uh, we have a policy with some cash value enough to yeah. to loan to ourselves to buy the car and then pay it back. But like as I keep looking about that, it's like it's like, yes, like if like suppose we just paid cash for it. It's true. I lose the cash. And I'm giving up interest that I could be gaining in the policy if I had just taken a loan from that. But if I buy cash, I also don't have any payments and I don't have any debt out to pay back to myself. And I don't like payments. And if I care about cash flow, then, you know, that's one less payment I'll have to make. Um, so, so like when you're when you're buying depreciating assets like that, I feel like I'm if I were to make a loan to myself and pay it back, like I'm just taking money from one pocket and putting it in the other. Like it's just kind of this big circular, but what you're talking about in terms of buying investment properties where there is independent cash flow coming in from that to pay the debt service. It's not me paying it from my own, I don't know, W2 income or, or whatever source of income I have. So it, 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 I had another sort of similar question that kind of correlates with that. Like, does it make sense um, to take the money in your policy and like loan it to other credit worthy people so that they can pay it back and they can pay the interest. So I don't have to do this. It's not like it's going to cost me anything. Like, is that a viable thing that people do? Yeah. So to address the first part of it, great, great question. 
because uh, when I consult with clients initially, that is one of the top questions that I get. Mm. Because, and by the way, I had the exact same reservations that you, that you had just there, and it's a it's a little bit of a paradigm shift because, um, you know, and this is this is when I wor- was working through this, uh, and this was a very big light bulb moment for me. So let's just use that example. So. You're going to purchase a car. You're taking the the, the money from the policy. You're financing the car with that. Now you have an extra payment, right, Mm -hmm. instead of just paying cash for it. So if you had just bought that cash, let's just say you go out to, to, you know, the the auto store or or the the place that you're going to buy the car (laughs) and you buy it and you buy cash. Now the money's out of your account. So what a mentor said to me at that stage was, MC, let me ask you a question. Are you ever going to save money again? And I said to him, well, of course I'm going to save money again. And he said, so where would you save your money? So in essence, and just just to, to come back full circle, in essence, you're replacing the bank where if you adjust the bank, you take the money from the bank, you, you bought the car with it, right? And now you're saving again. So from a cash flow perspective, you know, and, and, and being a person that has systems set up within their own personal economy, you're going to save you're going to save the money back into the bank. Right. You're going to build it up and save it back. In essence, what you're doing here is you're accessing your your the cash value from your policy through a policy loan. You're purchasing the car cash and you're just saving the money back, you know, in a, in a more efficient way that that works out big picture, yeah. big picture wise for you. Mm-hmm. And it's the same. It's the same with real estate investments. And I, and I know I keep bringing this in because it's just so powerful when I see it from from that point of view for down payments or investing in, in investments. When you for instance, let's just say, for instance, you're going to invest in, you know, I have, I have a client that and a lot of them invest in syndications or even turnkey. So they use the money to invest in syndication. So they take the money from their policy, they invest in the syndication. The cash flow from the syndication is paid back into the policy, but as they're saving, they also put still additional savings back into that policy because the money again becomes available again to be borrowed against. There's no limit on how many policy loans you can take out, so you you don't have to pay back the entire policy loan in full before you can access another one. So when you do that, there's kind of an infinite flow from an investment perspective between the policy and investments, because if you have enough money available again in your policy to invest in another syndication, and there's another opportunity, you can just do the same, you can just do the same thing, and the numbers uh, it's just staggering when you, you know, when you do one thing from your perspective of cash, like, look, you know, and I can, uh, there's numbers that, that, that we have played around and, and strategies w- that we've developed for clients where they have a passive income goal in mind. They know that, for instance, they have to deploy a certain amount of capital over, you know, 20 years, let's just say, to, to achieve that. They can do it without the policy. Absolutely. No one's saying that, you know, you, th- that that's not a good way to do it. Of course, do it. It's, it's, you'll still hit your target. But by integrating it with the insurance, not only do you have the life insurance components, but some of these, these, these uh, clients' uh, uh, strategies, there is a significant amount extra, additional, that they have in their policy tax-free over the course of 20 years just by running it through the, the policy. So it's just a way of doing it more efficiently. And like I said, I just copy and paste. What do they do in family offices? We copy and paste. You know, we take the strategies, we apply it to ourselves. And I always, you know, I always say you don't have to be a Rockefeller or a, a Carnegie to do some of the strategies that they implement and, and execute in their own lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of some of the arguments against the infinite banking concept and yep. or just against whole life insurance in general. I was talking with a uh, one of many things he does is sell life insurance. Yep. He, he was telling me that uh, with the various companies he works with, when he sells a whole life insurance policy, uh, he said that anywhere from half of the first year's premium to 120% of the first year's premium plus 1% of the ongoing premium goes to him as a commission. Yep. And, I, and I know like, yep. you know, if we're looking at this from the standpoint of, okay, whole life insurance is an alternative to a bank in terms of where I'm saving my money, yep. but a bank isn't going to take a huge chunk of my money like that up front, right? So, That's correct. I mean, knowing that, why would I do whole life insurance if I'm instantly losing so much money to just paying the salesman that sold it to me? Yep. 
You know what? That's a fantastic question. And I'll just preface this by saying I don't drink any Kool-Aid. I look at all different sides of the coin. Robert K. Saki said there's three sides of every coin, heads, tails, and the edge. Mm -hmm. So you always have to be aware. And look, here, here's the truth about it, right? The, the truth is that it, it's all about strategy and not just products. Mm -hmm. You know, when – you know, I know folks that invest in real estate, uh, businesses, Bitcoin, and uh, all these other different asset classes, gold and silver. And I know folks that have made a lot of money and are very successful. You know, I'll use Bitcoin for an example. I know folks that are <laughs> buying islands in the Caribbean right now because of their investments in Bitcoin wow. and, and some cryptos. And I know, unfortunately, I've seen stuff in the news of people that mortgaged their house. And lost everything. So what's the difference between it? It's all strategy. You know, uh, Dave, Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman says whole life is a horrible, horrible investment. And guess what? They're correct. You know, uh, I have folks that talk about how whole life is the foundational asset and one of the best places to put your money. And guess what? They're correct as well. So why, what, what is the difference between all of this? You know, and I see sometimes, you know, uh, I've been interviewed on a lot of shows, so I talk about it and then I get very angry emails. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you should see some of the emails that I get, yeah. this is a scam, you're a scam audit, you know, all that kind of stuff. And my response is, here is why infinite banking, bank on yourself, you know, all these other uh, terms that people use for it. Here's why it's a scam. It's a scam. If it's not set up correctly with the right agent and with the right carrier, because it's a completely different ballgame than what most insurance agents will do out there. What your friend or the individual that you spoke with said is 100 percent correct. I can't argue with that. I mean, absolutely. Most of these policies and again, tying in Dave Ramsey, that's why it's a horrible investment structured and set up that way. You know, first thing is that they have to realize it's not an investment mm -hmm. at all. It's a savings vehicle. And if you set it up with the right agent, uh, that's, you know, uh, an IBC practitioner or prosperity economics, you know, member or, you know, anyone in the, those types of groups that are out there, they'll be able to s set it up correctly for you, structure it correctly so that you're going to have some of the premiums that you put in. And again, this is all relative. Every case is different. Underwriting is different. But you're going to have almost 80 percent of the cash value available immediately in the first year of the premiums that you put in. So what these agents do, infinite banking practitioners, you know, prosperity economics folks, all those is they essentially cut down their commissions, you know, a lot. So you're going to have to find the right person to do that. Um, and, um, otherwise you're going to be sold, you know, a policy such as that angry emails that I get, you know, I, they, mm -hmm. you know, I said, look, this is what, this is what I went to my brother-in-law. I listened to you. He said, he said he could do it because unfortunately this is the truth coming from an outside perspective too, into the financial services sphere is most financial professionals and advisors will never admit that they're wrong or that they don't know something, which is it's just one of those things because mm -hmm. they think that they look they, they don't look, you know, they don't look smart or they yeah. think they look stupid just to I, I don't I know how to better put it, where if they actually would say to someone, look, I'm in insurance, but this is not my real my warehouse. I don't know anything about it. You know, do your research and find someone else to help you or f that person should look into it and at least refer someone or be able to provide that that would be so much better. So, yeah, there's. I would say to answer that question in full for your listeners, um, it could be the worst place to put your money. It could be one of the best places to put your money. It's all relative. It's the strategy, uh, not the end product. And in most asset classes and vehicles where people need to be successful, whether it's real estate, businesses, commodities, insurance, digital and blockchain technologies, paper assets, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds is a strategy. And then also a team of power players, professionals, advisors to help you execute it. And then also accountability. The same is for this. So it has to be set up correctly uh, for it to actually do what it's supposed to do. So it can be the worst place for you or it could be one of the most efficient places to put your money. Yeah. Now, I know, you know, I personally have a couple different term life insurance policies, which basically means I'm, I'm renting the life insurance. So you know, when it... When it lapses, when I'm 80, 
And if I haven't died yet, then I just wasted all that money for all those years. Yep. But it's also, at least at my current age, it cost me like a few hundred dollars per year. Whereas whole life insurance, you know, I, I just, it's all relative to how big your policy is. But, you know, I've heard numbers like 500 to 1,000 to a lot more per month. Um, and that's, uh, it's, it's something that's fairly inflexible, right? I mean, it's like, like you better be making those payments. And if you stop, the whole life insurance policy is going to start eating into itself. And like you said earlier, like you better have your financial house in order. Like don't sign up for this unless you're actually, you know, willing and able to follow through and pay on that policy. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've talked people out of bigger policies. Mm -hmm. I continually do that because you can always add policies to it. So I'll start by saying this. Uh, there's no deals in insurance. There's only trade-offs. This is the one of the best run businesses and business models that are out there. That's why Warren Buffett loves insurance companies, right? So it's, it's, there's no trade-offs. It's math. It's, it's, it's algorithms. Um, that's the first thing that I'll say. The second thing is, you know, a term insurance, people ask me about term insurance. It just is, you know, do I have term insurance? I actually do, believe it or not. I have banking policies set up according to the infinite banking concept and I have term policies as well. Why would I do that? Cause I have an overall strategy. I just don't focus on the, the, the products. And part of that strategy is protecting my human life value for my family. Meaning, for instance, if you're listening to this, uh, this, this interview and you make $100,000 a year, you're 30 years old, this company is going to look at, say, there's 35 to 40 years of insurability. Let's just say that that 30-year-old is married and has two children. Very young, right? You just started a young family. There's a lot to protect for your for your for your wife and for your children and so forth. So what happens if you if you pass away, right? Well, they're going to get the proceeds of the life insurance. And here's another thing that I'll say. One of the statements was there's no deals. The second thing is nobody gets rich, rich off insurance. Mm -hmm. No one. It's the same thing with car, property, and casualty. If you write off your car, you don't get rich. <laughs> mm -hmm. But from the check, you just get enough money to purchase a similar car or what the value of the car was. The same with, with, with life insurance. So if you pass away at that stage, yeah, let's just say um, his spouse gets a check at that stage for a uh, million dollars. People would say, ooh, that's, that's a lot of money. She's rich. No, no, no. They lost 3.5 to $4 million of his human life value, his capacity to earn over his lifetime for his family. So um, I think that's the, that's the big part to drill home on that. And I won't go into, uh, into that too, too much, but the strategy should be to protect you as, your produce, as the producer in your family, mm -hmm. the creator, the, the business person, the breadwinner, um, and then do it effectively as, along with your overall financial strategy and objectives of growing passive income uh, and so forth. So it's all holistic. Mm -hmm. There's many different moving parts. So, you know, be, I get this question so much, you know, should I buy term insurance? Because I see the to buy term, you know, uh, invest the rest kind of strategies. And again, efficiency, you know, wealthy people will never, ever uh, take on a risk that they cannot transfer to a third party. You mm -hmm. know, look at what Warren Buffett does. Warren Buffett's not going to buy a stock if he can't buy an option against that and protect his position in the market, you know, and transfer risk to a third party. He's just not going to do it. So if, if that's good enough for Warren Buffett, then why would I take on all the risk and have that term insurance expire, by the way? Let's just say that that same example, that 30-year-old, the term expires. Let's just say he had a 20-year term, right? Well, now he's 50. What if he's becoming uninsurable that, uh, for instance, uh, stuff happened like a cancer scare, right? Now he's uninsurable or he's 50 years old. Maybe his health deteriorated. He's getting higher, uh, uh, higher or different insurance ratings. So his premiums are through the roof. He's lost all of that money from the term, right? So there's, you know, I could go on and on about efficiencies and opportunity costs, but I would just advise your listeners to look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. uh, because everything's connected and we talk, this is my message, you know, this month and, and, and for the rest of the year, we're so focused on driving returns and increasing returns. Be efficient first. That's what I learned studying uh, a lot of wealthy folks. And lately um, I've had made some good friendships in the family office space. And uh, Seth, I'm just like a fly on the wall, like a sponge, just soaking it up, mm -hmm. taking notes, 
seeing what they do, what, where their focus lies, and it's completely different than where most of our focuses are. So their efficiency is a big thing because, uh, yeah, the amount of money that you lose throughout your lifetime by being efficient, just like with the term insurance thing, is, is, is huge. And by the way, just the last thing I'll say on term is there's convertible term options, which means that the policy can be converted into a whole life policy within the first 10 years mm -hmm. without the person having to go underwriting again. Mm -hmm. So as part of my strategy, speaking for myself, number one, it's to protect my, my net worth, my insurability to my family, my human life value. But also it's kind of like an option that I purchased for 10 years that if something should happen to me, that I will be able to convert that without going underwriting again and be convert that into a banking policy to, to, to continue to protect that human life value to my family. Yeah. I, I heard somewhere that, uh, I was kind of surprised to hear this, that term life insurance is the biggest profit center for life insurance companies. Is that true? Do you know? Absolutely. Is it? It's a, it's a gold mine. Oh yeah. Cause think about it from a, from an underwriting perspective, it's basically a bet between you and the insurance company mm -hmm. that the first from their side, it's like, listen, you're going to pay us money in premiums. If you pass away, we're going to pay out a fixed amount to your spouse or your family. Or, you know. And the other side of the coin is I'm going to pay premiums into this. And if something happens to me, they're going to pay out to my family. Mm -hmm. So the bet, I think the numbers are like, but it's around about like 90 to 8 to 99 percent of the time. The insurance company wins that bet. Yeah. Now, it's the same thing. If you look at options that just expire in the stock market. It's the same. I mean, I haven't I haven't looked at the ratios, so I, I don't want to I don't want to say that. But I can assume that there's a larger amount of options. Please correct me if I'm wrong and send me an email that just expires without without it being converted or, or, or making money. Right. So it's essentially the same thing. It's very profitable, the insurance companies. So I will just say to folks, again, it's term insurance. It just is yeah. how you use it and what it's part of from a holistic strategy makes that makes all the difference yeah it's called uh term insurance another name for it is, is hope you die insurance because right <laughs> because... think about it though the the you know the best day of a term insurance policy is 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 when you get it and the mm -hmm. first premium payment after that you're you're basically quote unquote losing the money mm -hmm. if you don't die within that that framework because mm -hmm. it's a sunk cost so um it it serves its purpose but you know i I really hope that uh, that my term policies never have to pay out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so if somebody's listening to this and they're interested in the infinite banking concept idea and getting involved with whole life insurance for this specific purpose, but for one reason or another, they can't get approved for a whole life policy. Maybe there's a, whatever, they had a cancer scare or, you know, there's some health issue and the underwriters decide, nope, it's not going to work. Are yep. they just kind of out of luck? Like, do they have any plan B that they can pursue or... What would you say to those people? Yeah, so this is a, another great question because it just triggered another thought that I had. This is the thing that blew my socks off, if you want to use that, 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 that analogy, mm -hmm. is when I researched this myself and learned about it, it just was mind-blowing to see how much banks and corporations own these, these uh, permanent life insurance contracts as part of their portfolio and where they warehouse their savings mm -hmm. you know the, uh, the banks have a there's there's a there's a type of capital term uh, and called tier one capital mm -hmm. um and the, the bank puts permanent life insurance in these contracts in tier one capital and they max it out by the way because this is this is the safest place to put their money and uh when when uh, regulators look at the financial health of a, of a bank too they look at the tier one capital so Banks have it. Corporations have it. There's executive comp packages. The other thing that 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 people will pull up when they see it, for instance, is that Jeffrey's uh, uh, GE's Jeffrey Immel rather walked away with a life insurance compensation package. You know, Jim Harbaugh, the the uh, the head coach of the University of Michigan, the Wolverines, yeah. you know, all of a sudden he gets compensated through a life insurance policy. Now, uh, how do how do these things work? You know, bank owned life insurance is called Boley. Corporate owned life insurance is called Coley. There's a lot of executive complaints. Now, how to answer your question, you can own a policy on someone else's life that you have insurability on. For instance, I own my son's policy. You know, I'm the owner. I pay it and I control my son's policy. It's on my son's life because I'm, this is part of his savings, right? For mm -hmm. 
for, for that, that, that my wife and I are putting together for him. So yeah. So for, if you're uninsurable, let's just say you're married and have a spouse. Well, you can, oh, you, both of you can own the policy, but it's underwritten on one spouse's life. The same thing with, uh, with companies, a company can own a policy on a person's life. You know, we do buy sell agreements to fund that for entrepreneurs and small businesses. We do executive comp structures where if you want to maintain and retain an employee, right? Um, one way of doing it is to own the policy. You as the company set it up on his life fund the policy for him and put a, for instance, a contract together and say, if you stay with us for 10 years or 15 years, you know, we'll sign over the entire policy to you, you know, that mm -hmm. type of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, you, you don't have to be it. Um, but you do have to have insurability like insurance companies will look at it and say, you know, you don't really have any insurable interest on this guy you just took off the street and now you own the policy mm. and the, the, uh, the, the, the insurance is on the person's life. So there are other options. You know, we've done great things. The, the legacy planning is a big thing. Parents owning policies on children, grandparents owning policies on uh, parents and children. There's many different ways to do it, but that's also another, I mean, you've, you've had a ton of great questions. I know these are frequently asked questions that, uh, that listeners might have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, out of curiosity, just more of a technical question. Say if I have a, a policy where the the death benefit is 150,000, maybe the current cash value in there is, I don't know, 20,000 or something like that. And if I take a loan out for most of that 20,000 and then the person, whether it's me or whoever's policy it is, they die. What is the death benefit then? Do they just take off the loan amount from the balance? Is that how it works? That's how it works. Okay. Yeah. So it would be, you know, it would, yeah, it, it, that, that's how it done. You have to look, think of it at this way. And this is also a mindset shift because mm -hmm. people will say using a different amount, let's just say there's a million dollars of cash value in there and there's a three million or four million death benefit and you take out, you know, you've borrowed all of the money, the million they're going to deduct that and then pay out the proceeds to the, the, the beneficiaries. If you still have that million in there, million dollars, let's just say it's $3 million death benefit, you get the $3 million. Mm -hmm. You don't get the $3 million and the million. Think of it as a savings account that pays out a multiple, in this example, a multiple of three times the account value. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't happen with a 401k. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen with an IRA or any – it doesn't happen with a checking or a, or a money market account. Mm -hmm. So um, – and also – tax free income tax free to beneficiaries again uh there are limits and caps for very very high net worth individuals i think they just raise that uh, as part of the tax cuts but uh that's that's when we get into a little bit more of the weeds but generally it's yeah income tax free to the beneficiaries yeah and and you may have touched on this earlier in our, our talk maybe i just missed it but i know one of the uh one of the big benefits of using a whole life policy for this purpose is that if you take a loan out, the cash value continues to grow as though you never took that loan out. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's collateralized, meaning so you're still going to enjoy the, the payments on that. Now, some companies do take in consideration if there is it. So maybe they won't pull, pay you the full amount of the dividends, for example. Mm -hmm. You still have the growth on it the principles guaranteed and so forth. So I just don't want to take a broad brush and yeah. just wipe all of it and, and, and bag it in the same, in the same bucket. So yeah, there, there are, there are things to consider, but I think the big picture is, is that you're collateralizing this asset that you're building up your savings to then be able to do something else with it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's what we call dollar maximization. You know, this is the one thing that I've studied from very wealthy individuals is they don't only just have their money work for them, but they have their money doing many different things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, this vehicle as part of a strategy, an overall holistic approach can have protective, uh, protective measures a defensive measures and then also can provide the opportunity for offensive capabilities as well. You know, I'm a, I'm a former sports guy. So I always talk about, and when I coach, I talk about protecting the goal line and then a defensive system and structure across the field and then offensive things. The same way this could be, this could be utilized as part of a strategy, you know, in your, in your own financial and, and in your business life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, MC, I really appreciate this, man. This has been really, really helpful. Um, I, I know we've covered 
Definitely not all there is to cover, but we've covered a lot of ground here. Do you have any suggestions if somebody wants to dig deeper into this? Uh, do you have any resources you want to share? Or I don't know. I know we talked about the uh, the Nelson Nash book that is so popular in this uh, in this uh, specialty, but. Is there anything yep. else? Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, Mr. Nelson Nash is one of my mentors too. And oh, cool. uh, he's, a, he's a great man. I've learned a, a lot from him. And that book, Becoming Your Own Banker, I think is, has been one of the things to not just uh, – it says uh, on the cover of the book, Unlocking the Infinite Banking Concept. Mm-hmm. But it's unlocked a lot of minds to open it up for a lot of uh, – opportunities and, and, and possibilities. So if you're interested, if listeners are interested in this, that book is a, is a recommendation. There's a new book out that if someone's truly interested in learning, that uh, all they have to do is reach out to me and I'll send them a copy of the book. The book is called The Case for IBC. And it's based on the boot camps done of explaining this concept and going into detail of just exactly how to use it in different different kind of cases and, and examples. I can I could send that out to your listeners. All they have to do is reach out to me, info at producerswealth.com. And then also there's a there's a course that I just completed actually that takes you from uh, from a person that's never heard of this concept or from any of these strategies to going through everything from the bottom up, taking and walking you through the different steps, they can access this course at your own banking system.com. It's your own banking system. Dot com. So if you're truly interested in just exp- exploring and learning, you know, I my mission is to is to share everything that I know and reach as many folks, too. So reach out to me for the book info at Producers Wealth and also check out that it's a free course that they can sign up for at your own banking system dot com. Awesome. Yeah. And abs- we'll be sure to I know we've, we've mentioned a number of things. I'll be sure to include links to all this stuff in the show notes for this episode, which you can find. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see it beneath this video. Or if you are uh, if you want to check out the blog, it's retipster.com forward slash 25. That's forward slash 25. But yeah, MC, I really appreciate your time, man. It's great to have you have you on this show. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. And your questions were really, it, it's great questions. And I think there's a lot of folks that that uh, that might have that same questions if they if they looked at, looked into it in the past and um, yeah I'll I'll just sign off by saying these these two things that I keep saying is you're the asset nothing will ever ever be the asset outside of you you know you're your number one asset you know real estate all these other things are assets because of you because of the strategy that you uh, that that you implement and because of the team members that you have working with you um, and uh, uh, this has been yeah this has been fantastic so I appreciate you having me on and. Uh, uh, I appreciate uh, t- uh, the opportunity to talk about this and addressing all the questions. Awesome. Thanks again, man. We'll talk to you later. Thank you.